Juju Smith-Schuster is a man people find easy to hate. However, I believe Juju has a very inspiring life story that many do not know, and one that many people can come to appreciate. This is the rise of Juju Smith-Schuster, the human who went from sleeping on the floor of his grandmother's garage during high school and college to a Super Bowl champion. On November 22, 1996, John Sherman Smith was born in Long Beach, California to Sammy Toa who raised him along with one of his sisters, Soomalo. The name Juju was a nickname that came from when his aunt started calling him John John when he was young. Juju's biological father left his family when he was young, but not long after, Lawrence Schuster came into the picture. He took care of Juju, his mom, and his sister. When one father figure left Juju's life, an even better one stepped in, and Lawrence had a big impact on the man Juju is today. Once Juju turned 18, he legally added Lawrence Schuster's surname to his last name to become Juju Smith Schuster, in honor of Lawrence who played such a large role in Juju's life. Growing up in Long Beach, Juju had plenty of valuable experiences in his life. Before becoming a star in high school, he played for Snoop Dogg's Youth Football League when he was in seventh grade. According to Snoop, Juju wasn't always one of the guys, but after having himself a big game on offense and defense, he made himself one of the guys. By the end of that game, he had everyone around him chanting his name. Now, that's an awesome moment in a vacuum, but when you take it a little deeper, this might have been one of the first times Juju had all eyes on him, and he loved it. And I don't think it's a stretch to say that his love for attention hasn't changed today. Now, there was a lesson Juju had to learn here. He could have very easily let that attention get to his head. Kids that young, they're impressionable, and they have minds that are malleable. Had he been surrounded by the wrong people, I guarantee you, Juju wouldn't be where he is today. Fortunately, he had good role models in his life who were able to guide him and teach him how to stay humble and how to stay grounded. And Juju's ability to manage that attention certainly shaped the man he'd eventually become. Juju attended Long Beach Poly High School in his hometown. Fun fact, at the time when Juju attended Long Beach Poly, the school held the record for producing the most NFL players. In high school, he was a highly touted wide receiver and safety, earning a plethora of awards, including Cal High Sports Junior of the Year, Max Preps All-State D1 First Team, All-CIF Pac-5 Offensive Player of the Year, the ESPN 300, among many, many other awards. Juju turned himself into a five-star athlete and was on a surefire path to be a college football star, if he was persistent with his work ethic. And speaking of his work ethic, I had the honor of interviewing his head coach at Long Beach Poly to talk about Juju and who he was as a player. Here's a shortened clip of my full interview with head coach Raul Lara. Joining me now is longtime Long Beach Poly head coach, 13 years there, uh, five-time CIF D1 Southern Section champions, the great Raul Lara. So today we're going to be talking a little about Juju Smith-Schuster, the kind of guy he was when you were coaching for him. And one of the first questions I, questions I want to ask you is, was there anything Juju Smith-Schuster brought to the table that really separated himself from the rest of the players? First of all, I need to make a correction that when you introduced me, I, I was there at, at Poly for 23 years. 13 of them years were head coach. I've seen a lot of great athletes coming through that school. And that was one thing that dawned us when, uh, when, when we see a freshman come in, you can really see the talent level right away. And he was one of them guys. But the problem with, uh, was I had three other receivers ahead of him or older than him that he had to kind of wait his turn. I never forget, I was talking to uh, a media guy one day, and I'm pretty close with him right now. I told him, I said, you know, see that kid right there? And I'm pointing out Juju. I said, that kid's gonna be special. Just wait till these other guys leave and he's gonna take over next year. And, and I'm, the next two years, this kid is gonna do something special here at Poly. And obviously he, you know, when he was a senior, that media guy would come back to me and say, man, you know, I still remember the day when you point him out when he was a freshman and a sophomore. And wow, I, I just, can't it's amazing what he's done and that that's the thing about juju he was one of them kids that was kind of you can kind of see the talent level and then character wise he was just a hard working kid even though he was so talented because sometimes a lot of kids that are talent they're kind of lazy 
he wasn't that way. He always wanted to go against the best competitor and this and that. And we had some pretty good DBs that he would compete with daily. One of them was uh, Marshawn Biggie. And and Marshall did a great job at USC and ended up playing some uh, NFL. And I think he's still playing, if I'm not mistaken. That that's the, that was the competition level at that time. Was there ever a moment you said, hey, this kid's going to the NFL? So I guess that answers that too. Yeah, um, I, I, when people ask me that, th the first thing I say is, is pretty much, well, first of all, a lot of things have to happen for him to even get there and they have to be good stuff but i would tell people oh he has the talent to 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 be one of them guys because you know obviously you know he might go to college and get hurt and this and that a couple of players happened to us where they had that talent and they've gone to college and then in misfortune they had a a, a a knee surgery or something like that and it kind of changes their their direction can you ever name me a moment where you saw Juju display a higher level of maturity compared to the other players? You know, I always tell people this story. There was a game, it was a senior, senior year. We were playing against Compton High School and we were pr pretty much uh, had the game handled at probably the third quarter. And he had a trip to, I believe, I want to say Ohio State or it might have been Michigan. So he came up to me and he goes, coach is there a chance I can leave right now to make my flight and this and that? And since we had the game handle, I said, yeah, you go ahead. I said, the only thing that I need you to do is if you're going to miss Monday's practice, you need to contact me before practice. Monday came and he didn't show up and I didn't get no phone call. And then so when he came Tuesday, he, he was kind of explaining, you know, why he couldn't call and this and that. And I told him, well, you know what? I The deal was, you know, if you don't come. And so that next game that we were having was our first round playoff game against Orange Lutheran. And uh, Orange Lutheran, we had a pretty good history with them going back and forth with many battles. And so everybody was nervous. And so I decided that he was going to be suspended for the first half. During that whole week, the person that was replacing Juju, he made sure, took him under his wing and mentored that kid all week. It was pretty remarkable. You know, so he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't upset. He just took, you know, wh whatever the punishment was. And, but the thing is just his character coming out and just kind of coaching that kid up and making sure that he was going to have success was pretty neat. Then when it came to the game, we were struggling with them in the first half with Orange Lutheran. And then the second half came out very very first play, I think we, we received the ball in the very first play on offense. We threw deep to Juju. He catches it and runs it in for a touchdown. I'm saying, okay, we're okay now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But, uh, yeah. it, it's just a story that just, you know, talks volume about his character. You know, he understood the punishment and then went over and beyond his duties of, uh, you know, helping out the other kid that, that actually replaced him. Was there ever a time where you saw Juju take a step up in terms of becoming a better man? First of all, I never questioned his maturity because he was always a hard working kid even as a freshman coming in sometimes he'll be goofy but i think that's just <laughs> that's just juju that's who we uh, <laughs> i mean i i know there was a, a time when we won the championship we started off zero and three and we really literally during them three losses we played against a team uh narbonne high school in la at that time they were one of the top schools and they 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 kicked our butt i believe the score was maybe 56 to 0 and uh that was a very humbling experience for obviously everybody on that team i had two senior running backs that kind of stepped up and kind of led the charge after that and then we kind of turned the season around and won every game and went all the way to cif and won the championship but juju was a catalyst on that part too so he kind of followed them two guys not really followed them but kind of took the younger kids and made sure that they were they were right too that was one thing that kind of I knew that in the future for Polly, especially when he became a senior, that that, you know, the team was going to follow him and he was probably going to be our leader. If you could say one thing to Juju right now, what would it be? I'm just so proud of him, man. I mean, it, it's neat, you know, uh, and I think he knows it and his mom knows it, that I'm a I'm a diehard Raider fan. And, uh, and so obviously, you know, when you talk about a Raider fan and then you talk about Pittsburgh, it's kind of a little, a little touchy there, <laughs> but, uh, obviously I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always cheering for him. Um, and just seeing him on television and doing the things that he's he's doing. And then honestly, regarding, you know, you just talked about his social media stuff. I think he's done an awesome job of kind of selling himself, selling the market of Juju. And so to me, that was kind of daunting because it, 
he would never show that side at poly really and so yeah and so that's why when we were seeing some of the stuff that he was doing we're like what the heck is he doing so i don't know if somebody's trying to get him out there more or whatever and they kind of you know talk about it before he does it but uh obviously you know i'm just proud of the kid the kid uh, is phenomenal it, not just a football player but just as a person every time we see each other you know he'll come down or i, I think last time i seen him was that the the century club had a, a banquet and obviously he came to me immediately, gave me a hug, gave my wife a hug and sat there and talk. And he's just so he's a he's a good kid. He's a good person. And that that's what I, I love about Juju. So I just and he knows that I think of him highly. Being a five star recruit on the Jackrabbits, Juju had all eyes on him once again and he loved it. But he still did not let that distract him from the mission. With that said, his time growing up wasn't the sunshine and rainbows I'm currently painting it out to be. About eight years before he was drafted, Juju's family had lost their jobs and their home. His family had to move into his grandmother's garage, and Juju went on and off through high school and college, sleeping on that garage floor with nothing but a blanket to separate him and the floor. So really growing up, all Juju had was family and football. And this is one of the reasons I got such a hard time with people calling Juju immature, when they have no idea the shit he's had to go through in his life. At this rock bottom point in his life, Juju could have easily called his life a wash, but instead he fought for his dream to make a pro career out of his athletic abilities. That's inspiring, man. Yet he gets flack from football fans because he likes to dance and talk a bit of trash. Come on, man. Career-wise, all signs pointed to Juju going pro, but being in high school, you still need a backup plan. In an interview with ESPN, he was discussing his thought process as to which college he should accept an offer from. While noting that USC was a dream school for him, Alabama was high up on his list because they have an amazing medical program. Juju's plan was to be a chiropractor or to work in sports medicine should football not work out for him. With that said, Juju initially decided to go to Oregon to play for the Ducks. However, with the recruiting skills of then USC wide receiver coach and former Steelers quarterback, T. Martin, Juju eventually signed his letter of intent to play for the USC Trojans starting in 2014. Juju played three years of football for USC as a wide receiver. Juju had an immediate impact on the Trojans when he was a freshman, starting 13 of his 14 games that year, racking up 54 receptions for 724 yards and five touchdowns, and he made the 2014 all pac 12 second team, as well as winning USC's John McKay Award for his competitive spirit. His best season, however, was undoubtedly his sophomore year in 2015, where in 14 games, he had 89 receptions and more than doubled his production with 1,454 yards and 10 touchdowns. Keep in mind, Juju also had a broken right hand with the plate and eight screws in it for a few of those games. He ended up making first team for all pack 12, AP all pack 12, and Phil Steele all pack 12. He was also only the 17th receiver in USC history to rack up a thousand yards, and he was also one of just the two times Juju racked up 1,000 yards in his career so far. In his final season with the Trojans, Juju played 13 games and racked up 70 receptions for 914 yards, but he still had 10 touchdowns, including a standout game in the Rose Bowl with seven catches for 133 yards and a touchdown. Now, while Juju was an elite college wide receiver, the intangibles he possessed were even more valuable. According to Michael Lev of the Orange County Register, there's nothing he can't do on a football field. If every Trojan worked and played as hard as Smith Schuster, USC would be undefeated. Smith Schuster has become the go-to guy he was destined to be. His physical gifts are extraordinary. He also offers a lot in the way of intangibles. He's among the Trojans' most enthusiastic and hardest working players. His positive attitude is infectious. He's already a team leader. Juju is unquestionably one of USC's most valuable players. Juju is a natural born leader and elite when it comes to hard work. Just ask Colin Coward. During an interview with Snoop Dogg, Colin recalls a quote from a USC coach at the time. The coach talked about Juju and said, I think he's the hardest working player to ever be a Trojan. Colin went on to mention how Juju was held in a much higher regard than most college athletes. As any college football player should do after a great junior season, Juju Smith-Schuster declared for the 2017 NFL Draft. The Pittsburgh Steelers selected wide receiver Juju Smith-Schuster out of USC with the 62nd overall pick in the second round of the 2017 NFL Draft. Coming into Steelers training camp, Juju was listed as a sixth wide receiver on the depth chart, 
behind Sammy Coates, Darius Hayward Bay, Eli Rogers, Marcus Tucker, Justin Hunter, Martavis Bryant, and a little known six round draft pick by the name of Antonio Brown. Now, once again, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. The drafting of Juju Smith Schuster also brought up some off the field drama. After returning from a season long suspension, Steelers receiver Martavis Bryant welcomed Juju to the team by tweeting, LOL, that's Sammy Coates' replacement, not mine. Take it how you want it. I am back. And how did Juju respond to his new teammate? He didn't say a word. He didn't say a damn thing. Not on social media, at least. In person, that's probably a different story. I'm sure they at least spoke about it on the practice field, but on social media, Juju didn't say anything. And Juju had a solid social media following when it happened. So the fact he kept his mouth shut when he could have clapped back and gotten all kinds of attention, it's impressive. And not only was it impressive, it showed a contrast of maturity between Juju and the rest of the wide receiver room. After not seeing action in his first regular season game, Juju came onto the scene in week two versus the Vikings, scoring his first NFL touchdown off of a Ben Roethlisberger shovel pass. Immediately after, we saw him do for the first time one of the things that once made him famous, touchdown celebrations. Juju went outside the end zone and pretended throwing dice with his teammates. And this was the first in a long line of awesome touchdown celebrations. Two weeks later, Juju scored a touchdown down the middle versus Baltimore, and what does he do? He performs a freaking Kamehameha celebration from Dragon Ball Z. A few weeks later versus the Bengals, he scores a touchdown, and he and Le'Veon Bell start playing hide and seek. It was hilarious, and at the time, people loved it. Once again, all eyes were on Juju, and like his past suggests, he enjoyed the attention, and I don't blame him for that at all. Put yourself in his shoes. Think of the last time you had a crowd of people laughing at you for a joke. Or maybe you played football at any level and have people cheering you on for scoring a touchdown. For me, when a video performs well, it's kind of a guilty pleasure. People are having a good time because of something cool you did. I think his celebrations are and were really fun, and he certainly had more where that came from. Now, I want to talk about Martavis Bryant again because it was in that same Bengals game where he started chirping about being better than Juju once again. After having a quiet game, Martavis saw an Instagram comment saying Juju was better than him. And surely Martavis handled this like a mature teammate, right? He says, Juju is nowhere near better than me, fool. All they need to do is give me what I want, and y'all can have Juju and whoever else. He proceeded to delete that comment, but as a Streisand effect suggests, that brought more attention to the situation by sweeping it under the rug. He then started playing damage control, saying, Juju is the future and has great talent and is going to be one of the best to play the game. I just want him to get his, and I want mine, period, point blank. Nobody did nothing to get me back. I worked my butt off to get myself back with no help and little support. In due time, the process will show. That really just dug an even deeper hole for himself. And Juju responded to Martavis like any good teammate should. He responded to it with empathy. Juju replied to the situation saying, I get where he's coming from. I can put myself in his shoes. There's only one ball, it's tough. And at the end of the day, we have to do what's best for our team. Moving forward, hopefully we do get him the ball more. He's a great player, a great athlete, I would like him to be on our team. Moving forward, I think he's going to be big for us. Martavis and Juju eventually talked it out and made up, and Martavis made it clear that he just wants his touches and the fans can have whoever we want a receiver. Meanwhile, Juju's really just handling the situation well and showing why he was in fact the most mature receiver on the team. If that wasn't already enough for the Steeler fans to like Juju, let's talk about the play that once made Steeler fans fall in love with him. December 4th, 2017. 7 minutes, 10 seconds left in the half. Ben Roethlisberger checks the ball down to Le'Veon Bell. And watch out, here comes Juju Smith-Schuster, who cracks none other than Vontez Perfect and stands over him. This is where I believe Steeler Nation fell in love with Juju Smith-Schuster. The hit was so poetic. Vontez Perfect at the time was considered the dirtiest player in the league, looking to injure other players, including Antonio Brown. Now here comes the youngest player in the NFL, a kid who had to ride his bike to Steelers practice. Here comes Juju laying out the headhunter of the league, leaving us with a picture that speaks a thousand words. However, the play did get Juju suspended for about a week, but it felt so worth it. After the suspension, Juju continued to ball out, scoring touchdowns and making highlight reel celebrations. He also did some collaborations with Danny Duncan in the offseason, making videos of themselves feeding the homeless. Some people think they just did it for clout and attention by putting it on YouTube. In my opinion, publicized or not, good deeds are good deeds, and it's always awesome to share positivity in the world. Regardless, after his rookie year, Juju Smith-Schuster has shown that he's going to be a star wide receiver in the coming years.
Year two was special for Juju Smith-Schuster. On day one of the 2018 NFL Draft, the Steelers had enough with the distraction veteran wide receiver Martavis Bryant has become and traded him away to the Oakland Raiders. This officially cemented Juju Smith-Schuster as the Steelers' number two wide receiver. Now, when talking about second-year players, it's not uncommon to see them have a down year, a term people like to coin a sophomore slump. Juju, however, had anything but a sophomore slump, as 2018 was his best season on the gridiron with the numbers to back his play up. He had 111 receptions for 1,426 yards and seven touchdowns, including a 97-yard touchdown reception versus Denver. Juju balled out this year, having a better season than Antonio Brown. Granted, AB was drawing respect from opposing defenders, giving Juju more opportunities to eat, but he caught the balls that were thrown to him, and he's built himself up to be Pittsburgh's most reliable wide receiver. However, he did have one bad play that year that made everyone forget how great of a season he was having. All eyes were on him once again, but not in a good way. In Week 16 versus the Saints, the score is 31-28 New Orleans. The Steelers have the ball with 41 seconds left and are driving down the field to attempt a game-tying field goal. Big Ben finds Juju down the middle, and in field goal range, Juju coughs up the football, sealing the win for the Saints and taking the Steelers' playoff hopes out of their own hands. You have to imagine this one is hard on Juju. Also keep in mind, this is a primetime game. This is the first time a lot of people ever even watch Juju Smith-Schuster, and he fumbled the game away at the very end. This is one of the first times all eyes were on Juju for the wrong reasons. There's people out there today who only know Juju for his very few bad plays instead of his countless great plays. This play left a stain on Juju's career, and you better believe he was apologetic about it. Regardless of that blunder on his resume, the Steelers made a move that would promote him to wide receiver one. After a season of Antonio Brown drama, the Steelers traded him away to the Raiders, making Juju Smith-Schuster the Pittsburgh Steelers' number one wide receiver. It's a title he's been working his ass off to earn his whole life. Year 3 is definitely an interesting year for Juju to highlight, or low light, depending on how you look at it. This was around the time TikTok was taking the world by storm, and on October 22nd, 2019, Juju uploaded his first TikTok. Now, he only uploaded three during the season, so we're not going to focus on that just yet. During Juju's first year as wide receiver one, one of the worst things that could happen to him as a wide receiver happened. His Hall of Fame quarterback was injured and ruled out for the season, leaving Mason Rudolph and Devlin the Duck Hodges as his quarterbacks throwing the ball to him. The Steelers ended up going 8-8 eight and, eight and missing the playoffs in what ended up being an injury-riddled season for the third-year Juju. And now this is where the TikToks in football hit a crossing road for Juju. A lot of people saw that Juju was having his worst statistical season, racking up 552 yards and three touchdowns. Now, when NFL fans see low numbers like that, people look for a scapegoat. They look for one thing to blame to explain why his stats were so low. The reality is context matters, so let's answer the question. Why were Juju's stats so low? One factor, obviously, he had two super inexperienced quarterbacks throwing him the rock. Another factor, his fellow wide receivers Deontay Johnson and James Washington also picked up an emerging role on the offense. Those two became big contributors for the Steelers because Juju became the receiver teams had to game plan for. In addition to that, Juju missed four games to injury this year. And if he was healthy those four games, he might have been the difference in the Steelers making the playoffs in 2019 as Pittsburgh finished the year two games out of a playoff berth. The truth is, when you go back and cut on the tape, the balls Juju was thrown, he made a big play out of them almost every single time. And whether you like it or not, Juju has hands. He's a kid trying to make the best out of a crappy situation, something he's done his entire life on and off the field. Juju was once again dealt a terrible hand, and he did not fold. He did not complain once. He also established the Juju Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting youth initiatives and lifting the spirits of those in need. That's a man I can respect. 2020 is the year where Juju Smith-Schuster became the NFL's most hated wide receiver. And while I love Juju and I disagree with why he gets so much hate, I can understand it. Juju balled out for the majority of 2020, scoring two touchdowns to open the year. Thing is, when people think about 2020 Juju, they don't think about his great play. They think about him dancing on logos on TikTok. People hated that, and it gave them more reason to hate the Steelers who opened the season 11-0. Now, I know this video has mostly defended Juju, but will I defend him here? Nah. On one hand, dancing on an opponent's logo is fun for social media, but on the other hand, it is a sign of disrespect. It gave opponents fuel to go out and win, and those teams were definitely motivated to win in spite of Juju's antics. With that said, after the Steelers-Bills game, Juju came out and said, for the betterment of the team, he's going to stop dancing on logos. He lived up to his word, and you have to respect that. 
He acknowledged his mistakes and stopped making those same mistakes. However, this isn't the last time Juju gave fuel to other teams. In a presser before their wild card game versus Cleveland, Juju was asked about the Browns, to which Juju responded like this. I feel like this Browns team is has a different vibe, a more successful vibe than what you've seen in the past from them. Nah, I think they're still the same Browns team I play every year. I think they're nameless great faces. Um, they yes, they have a couple good players on, on their team, but at the end of the day, like, I don't, I don't know, like, it's, it's the Browns is the Browns, and that's just, like, one of those things that, you know, AFC North football, and you know, they're a good team, but um, I'm just happy we're, we're playing them again, you know, this, this Sunday. On paper, that sounds like Juju is talking smack to the Browns, but if you go back and watch the presser, he wasn't deliberately talking crap. He was just sharing his mentality that he doesn't care who the opponent is. He's going to go out there and be the best player he can be. Truth is, though, his word choice made for good headlines, and the Browns definitely use it as motivation for their playoff game versus Pittsburgh. I think in the future, Juju needs to be more careful with what he says in pressers, but when you factor in the context, it's not a very strong reason to hate on Juju. In 2020, Juju racked up 831 yards and 9 touchdowns and dealt with the same criticisms as 2019. The context is Juju was one of four contributors on this offense, with the emergence of rookie Chase Claypool and two other great targets in Deontay Johnson and James Washington. Juju can't control who his quarterback throws to. All he can control is if he can make a play on the passes that are thrown to him, and that's exactly what he did. Juju caught everything thrown to him and turned into a power running back when the ball was in his hands because he refused to go down without a fight. And you can credit that to all the strength training he does in the offseason every year. Juju has become a bigger and stronger receiver than when he came into the league and the tape backs that up. That is something the stats won't tell you. He was also spotted buying a homeless man some lunch. No cameras. He wasn't seeking attention. Just a good man doing a good deed. And this is one of the years where Juju established himself as not only one of the most reliable receivers in football, but also a great human being. It's a 2021 offseason and Juju is now a free agent. For months, Steelers fans have been wondering if Juju would resign on a low money deal to stay with Pittsburgh. The Steelers didn't have the cap space to pay him his market value, so the only way for him to continue being a Steeler is if he takes less money. And there was a week where Steeler fans had to hold their breath. Juju was sending out hints that he might move on to a new team. On March 19th, however, news broke that Juju turned down more lucrative offers from the Chiefs, Eagles, and Ravens to stay with the Steelers for at least one more year. People inside the organization loved Juju. Big Ben was one of his biggest aficionados to bring him back. He says, I was really excited to get him back. I felt like I was in Juju's ear and in Coach Tomlin's ear a lot during that process the last 12 or 24 hours. Just to have a familiar face and a guy that brings so much to this team, Ben loved Juju. Unfortunately, his playing time in 2021 was short-lived. He hurt his shoulder fighting for extra yards versus the Broncos and ended up being ruled out for the season. He was taking a bigger step as a leader this year. Listen to what his teammate Deontay Johnson had to say. We're not worried about that. We're still going to go out there and play for Juju. Uh, no matter what his situation is, we still go out there and do our thing. The team was hurting. Juju had not only been a great player his whole life, but always a great person. He was extremely emotional when he revealed how he's feeling after being ruled out. Last night was the hardest night for me because football has done so much for me in my life, um, more than you guys will ever know. And, it, and, and different things in the world, whether, whether it's, uh, you know, it could be family, friends, or any motivation that may be. Um, My stepdad put me in football when I was four years old. And it, it was fun. I mean, you get to hit kids and not get in trouble, right? <laughs> so I always, I, always say, I always loved the game. Last night was hard for me because when I got the call from the doctors and, you know, a shoulder injury, I thought, you know, you put it back in and, you know, you'll be fine within two weeks. And, you know, our bye week was coming up. I was like, I, I can take two weeks off, you know, come back and, you know, play this, this season. And... The doctor called me, he was like, hey man, like, I think we have, to, we have to do the surgery and get a second opinion. And it said it was a season ending injury. And, you know, I sat there, I, I cried, I cried all night. I cried because like, I, I love this game so much more than anyone will know. I know the whole social media thing and like, the whole TikTok and like dancing and all that, like, I do it because like it's my personality and I love it. But yeah, don't get me wrong, but football will always come first. Without football, I wouldn't be who I am today. Without football, this wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't have create or be a, a role model for a lot of people. And I cried that night because you just never know what the future holds for you. 
if I, if I look at if I look at the light in front of me and don't don't keep my head down, just keep pushing forward, and I come back any strong, come back even stronger than I was, you know, this year. Um, I know God has a bright future for me. Juju ended up returning to make a playoff appearance versus the Chiefs, where he got five balls for 26 yards in limited playing time. And little did we know, his time as a Pittsburgh Steeler would come to an end. In the 2022 offseason, Juju signed with the Kansas City Chiefs. He explained that after 2021, the Steelers weren't offering him the kind of money he was looking for, and the Chiefs were just a better situation for him. Couple that with the fact that he could either stay in Pittsburgh where he didn't know who his quarterback would be, or take less guaranteed money to go to KC and play with Pat Mahomes where he has a shot at winning a Super Bowl. It's a no-brainer why he chose to go to the Chiefs. He signed a one-year deal worth $3.7 million plus a plethora of incentives, including playing time, performance, a Pro Bowl appearance, and a Super Bowl win. And guess what? He matched most of those incentives, and he proved he made a great decision going to KC. Even though he had an injury-riddled season involving a concussion and a lingering knee injury, he still put up 78 receptions for 933 yards and three touchdowns, including multiple 100-yard games this year. He established himself as the Chiefs' number one wide receiver. He was a big piece of the Chiefs' puzzle in 2022, but his impact was felt most in the biggest game of the year. It was Super Bowl 57 where Juju played a huge role towards the end of the game and the Chiefs' second Super Bowl win in four years. Now, I know he talked a bit of crap after the game to James Bradbury. Look, I, I wouldn't have done it, but I get it. He was fought hard to get to where he is. He deserves to talk a bit of trash. Juju is a human, just like you and me. He loves the game of football. Can he be goofy at times? Yeah, that's who he is. Does he deserve the hate he gets? I don't think so. Juju is not only an awesome football player, but an even more awesome human being. He's a guy who many find easy to hate, but I hope at least one person can empathize with this story and have a change of heart and appreciate everything Juju had done to get to where he is today. Juju Smith-Schuster, the kid who was sleeping on the floor of his grandma's garage not too long ago, just won a freaking Super Bowl. He literally started from the bottom, now he's here. Wow, another video essay is complete. You guys, I just wanna say thank you and I appreciate you for sticking through the end, clicking on this video, listening to half an hour of me talking, telling a story about Juju Smith-Schuster. It means a lot. This is what I wanna do for a living someday. Man, let me explain why I chose Juju for this one. He's always been a player near and dear to my heart. Um, he grew up really close to me. He grew up in Long Beach, California. It's like a, what, 15 minute drive from where I live, where I grew up. And when he was drafted and I found out he was local to me, I guess, I was like, man, this guy's awesome. I started learning about him, his story, and then he started becoming a really fun wide receiver to watch for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And then you see not only the football side of him, but he's just such an awesome human to learn about, to watch, to see the experiences he goes through. He's an awesome human being, very hard worker, very inspiring, man. His story, I think, is very inspiring. And I hope I hope you were a little bit inspired by that story as well, from sleeping on the floor of your grandmother's garage to a Super Bowl champion. Gosh, that's an awesome, awesome story. I appreciate you for sticking to the end. I appreciate you for watching this video. Let me know if you learned anything new. And I also want to thank some new YouTube members, patrons from the George Pickens video essay. I want to thank James Murray and I want to thank Donnie Black for becoming Diamond Club members. You can become a Diamond Club YouTube member by hitting the join button underneath this video or in the description if you're on iPhone, whichever one. You can give a dollar a month or you can go to patreon.com forward slash Devin Angle. And you know, you give a dollar a month to either of those platforms. It really helps me turn this show into my full-time job. You know, this is something I want to do for a living someday. I, I think you can see the love, the effort I put into these videos. And I'll tell you what, it's, it's a mission to make each one. It's a mission to make each one, but I love it. And that dollar a month really does support me. If I can turn this show into my full-time job, if I can get more support from Patreon, the YouTube member program, it really does help me have more of a stable income from YouTube to turn this into my full-time job. But right now, you know, I'm in school, I'm working, doing this. It's a mission, man. It's a mission. But I appreciate you for sticking with me. I appreciate you for supporting. It means a lot. Najee Harris is next. I'll let you guys know that now. I'm working on his script right now. 
And if you like this video, I also have a Kenny Pickett and George Pickens life story video essay. Those two are up. Y'all blew those up. I appreciate the hell out of y'all for that. And also a big thank you. We just hit 4,000 subscribers a couple hours ago as of me recording this clip right here. Means a lot. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. God, I love this, man. I love you guys. I appreciate you. My name is Devin Engel. This is the Here We Go Show. I'm the Steelers Storyteller. I hope you have a good one. And as always, here we go.